From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audience worldwide, I'm David Weston. Welcome now to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. We begin our program today with a very special guest. She is the Speaker of the House, Ms. Nancy Pelosi. So, M Madam Speaker, thank you for joining us. It was reported earlier today in Washington that you've expressed skepticism whether we can get that fourth round of stimulus before the election. Are you skeptical? Well, I'm hopeful. Uh, actually, uh, doesn't mean I'm positive, but I am hopeful. Uh, we do have uh, some areas of disagreement that are broad, and uh, but we're going to be talking again later today. So uh, we're still alive, and we're still talking, and I'm hopeful that we can reach an agreement. The uh, I think that was an interpretation of some remarks. I never said I was skeptical. Uh, but you might describe it that way uh, if you understand some of the concerns that we have for our police and fire and health care workers, our transportation, sanitation, teachers, teachers, teachers. We're still fighting uh, for more money. We think that the administration is coming in far too low uh, for our heroes. Uh, for our crush the virus, I think we're close in terms of money. Not, we're yielding on that quite a bit, but, uh, but uh, close on that, except we have to see the language. The, one of the biggest differences is how we put money in people's pockets. And uh, in the CARES Act, the Republicans stealthily, I might add, put in $150 billion for the net operating loss benefit, benefiting a small percentage of the American people, the wealthiest in our country. We had $149 billion, almost a similar number, in this legislation now, the, Hope, the, uh, uh, the, the um, HEROES Act, that is for poorer families, lower income families. And it's a refundable tax credit, or child tax credit, earned income tax credit. They have zero. 150 for the wealthiest, zero for the other. We are the reverse. We are 149, which we took down to 54 in the interest of finding common ground. We took down to 54 by shortening the amount of time it applies, down to 54 billion dollars. As of yesterday, we're still at zero. We're hoping they will come up on that. And we have great opposition in our caucus to the tax cut that is retroactive, having nothing to do with the uh, uh, coronavirus. And then we have issues that relate to, again, the language for the elections, for census, and the rest. But again, we, uh, we're understanding our differences, and that's progress. And we are hopeful that we can reach. In the meantime, though, we're very proud of our HEROES bill that we are going to bring to the floor today. Uh, it is the work of all of our committee, many of our committee chairs. It is scientifically, institutionally, academically documented to be what is needed in order to meet the needs of the American people and, again, cut back drastically by cutting the time frame or putting some of the provisions onto the appropriations bills that we are going to be negotiating shortly. Okay, Madam Speaker, some of us are just waking up to the net operating loss provisions in the CARES Act and mm -hmm. now in what's proposed by the Republicans. Explain those to us a little bit, because as I understand it, it would particularly benefit perhaps oil companies and some real estate uh, uh, developers as well. What is the rationale for that? And do you believe, you're a shrewd negotiator, do you believe that the White House is really committed to those not, uh, net operating losses that you say would be $150 billion? Well, that's already in the CARES Act, uh, much to our dismay. Uh, when the CARES Act was written, it was written on the Senate side. At that time, the bill was a very trickle-down bill, and we countered with our t take responsibility bill, which was a bubble up, working families bubble up, and we came to a compromise. Uh, but they still had that in the bill. So that is the law in terms of the CARES Act right now. We have great resistance to it, and our Ways and Means Committee said we're getting rid of that, and not only that, we're going to take away some other uh, unfair advantages that they have implemented. So we're like at 265 of tax breaks that we want to take out. But the 150 is what directly relates to the CARES Act. Retroactive, everything we're supposed to be doing is supposed to be coronavirus-centric. That wasn't. So I don't know who benefits from the net operating loss in the administration, but I do know that the wealthiest people in our country do. And, and so when people say, as some of you do, isn't something better than nothing? No, it could be a missed opportunity. And we refuse to have meet the needs of the poorest people in our country or the most uh, 
insecure economically, food insecure, housing insecure people are being used uh, to, uh, to give a tax break to the high end just so we can give a small something uh, to the low end. So that makes it sound like that's going to be pretty difficult for you to go along with something that has that in. You're going to have to insist on that. That leads to some of the skepticism, maybe not in your part, but in other people's part, that something's going to get done. If it does not get done, why will it not get done? What will be the issues, I should say, that really prevent well, I would hope that they, I would hope that they would at the, definitely come back with a proposal for the uh, tax cuts, the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, refundability. I would hope that they would come back with that. The debate on the other taxes is, is our leverage, but they may never leave, you know, how wedded they are to tax cuts at the high end. Uh, the other is the state and local, because this is necessary. You and I would not even be where we are without state and local government with the uh, police and fires, uh, food, transportation, sanitation, as I said earlier, teachers, teachers, teachers for our schools food suppliers and the rest, and they want to uh, just nickel and dime our state and local governments, our heroes, people who risk their lives to save lives, and now they may lose their jobs. And by the way, they go on unemployment insurance. So what's that? Let's uh, cut the benefits, let the, the, meeting the needs of the people, uh, fire people, have them on unemployment insurance, instead of us making a, a, a worthy uh, respect and honor our, our, uh, our heroes. And that's, that's a big, big difference. And there's some other differences. For example, maybe of interest to your viewers, uh, we have PPP, we're going to do more for PPP, but also we have some initiatives for restaurants and for uh, venues, small venues across the country who for some reason or other do not fit in any of the other uh, categories. And what we're doing there is to say these have to be treated differently. PPP is a lending program. We hope to have in our discussion some forgiveness of those loans for small, uh, for small uh, businesses as well as women, minority-owned businesses, et cetera. That's a whole discussion, and we're well down that path from previous bills. But in addition to that, the restaurant piece, for example, is not a loan. It's a grant from the Secretary of the Treasury, a grant. Uh, and the restaurant business as, as you know, as a community, it, it affects so much and they're taking a terrible beating. So even right. if they had a loan under PPP, you can pay the rent and you can pay the utilities and, and pay some employees for eight weeks. But if you ain't got no customers, you ain't got no business. And so this is a much longer grant program, goes six months and a much bigger boost to the vitality and the survivability and sustainability right. of the restaurant industry. Yeah, Madam Speaker, it sounds like there's a fair amount of ground to cover, and there is some urgency. Yeah. I know you feel that urgency. We had Andrew Cuomo, the governor yeah. of New York, just today saying the number of COVID cases is back up to the highest level since May. Every day yeah. that goes by, we see one company or another announcing tens of thousands of layoffs. Yeah. Is that affecting the negotiation? Is that putting pressure on either side, on both sides? Well, the, the, would hope it would put pressure on them to do something about crushing the virus. We, for months and months and months, for our first bill, March 4th, was about testing, testing, testing. I don't want to go into, you know, uh, the record and the history of that. So now we have a big, uh, big pillar of this bill about testing, tracing, treatment. Mask wearing, space, sanitation, all of that is very specific in the language, and that's why it's not just the money, it's the language as well, to make sure this gets done. Because it is the way to crush the virus so that we can open our economy more broadly and our schools more, both more safely. So that is, I think, the heart of the matter. Uh, and, that, and that is, is that now one point related to that is one other obstacle uh, uh, to a, a quicker resolution of this is uh, the, uh, the OSHA provisions, we think that in light of, we've always needed stronger OSHA provisions, but in light of the coronavirus, that's very, very important. And it is an opportunity for businesses to get some protection for their workers and for themselves if they implement uh, the strong worker safety provisions. Right now, right now, if you were an, an essential worker, which I'm sure you are in your field, but if you're at this uh, um, lower level of employee, you have to, you're de deemed essential, 
you must go to work at the meatpacking firm or whatever. They, they haven't have implemented any OSHA provisions. You're subjected to catching the virus. If you do, you have no recourse to the employer. You take that home, spread it to your family. But if you say, I'm an essential worker, I don't want to risk my family's health and mine by going to a place that does not have the proper OSHA provision, you don't get unemployment insurance. Right. Uh, Madam Speaker, I want to come back so, to some... So we have to, we have to uh, make that more decent. Right. Madam Speaker, I want to come back to something you referred to earlier, and that is the half a loaf versus the whole loaf. Put aside, if we can for a moment, the question you raised about net operating losses and some mischief that may be done. If you could take that away, aren't you better off doing some good for the millions of people who are not having the support they need right now? Because if we don't get it done before the election, we're really talking about going into 2021, aren't we? Well, let me just say this. This isn't half a loaf. What they're offering is the heel of the loaf. We've come down one, uh, one trillion dollars. Then we came down a trillion two hundred billion dollars. Pretty soon we're just having a conversation. We're not really meeting the needs of the American people. And you really can't just say, well, just take this. Uh, um, no, it's a missed opportunity. We're in a negotiation. We're talking about money, we're talking about values, we're talking about the language to implement right. it. Yeah. And it, you, if you, it's no use going into a negotiation if you say, I'll just take the path of least resistance with the smallest right. amount of money that gives tax breaks at the high end, uh, less uh, to those who need it the most. And by the way, you know better than I, as I say to you on all these shows, this is a, a consumer confidence. These people spend this money immediately. It's urgently needed. And inject demand into the economy, create jobs. It's a stimulus. Minister, it strikes me that we listened to a debate for 90 minutes earlier this week, and stimulus didn't really hardly come up at all. It was hard to find it mm -hmm. in the discussion, given how important it is. Would it help this negotiation if President Trump personally got involved in the negotiation rather than delegating it to Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin? No, I, I think that Secretary Mnuchin is, uh, uh, appropriately represents the president's views. And, and, and when we have a break in our negotiations, he's in consultation with the president. That's not unusual. When I did, worked with President Bush frequently, he would say, these are the people who speak for me. They really did speak for him. <laughs> then he has to go back, but it's okay. Uh, we have a, uh, we're pretty far down the path to having some uh, uh, understanding of where we're all coming from on this. And I'm very proud of my caucus because they have all different kinds of views. And that's what I love about being a leader of a, a caucus that is, uh, uh, as well as Speaker of the House, that is uh, not, not uh, they, they, again, it's exuberant. We have exuberance. We're not a lockstep and, and we're not uh, just all on one page. And we have that vitality that has built the consensus that is very strong and sustainable for the American people and our chairs, as I said, scientifically, academically, institutionally, putting forth what we can defensively say this is needed and will make a difference in the lives of the American people. And we've come down very far in the negotiations, not abandoning any priorities, but shortening the timetable and putting some things off uh, to the appropriations. You know, three, four and a half months since we introduced the right. HEROES Act, we're three and a half months until we're sworn in as a new Congress yeah. and less than four months until we inaugurate the President of the United States. So the horizon, we're approaching that horizon and hopefully in doing so we can be well prepared by coming to agreement now on this legislation, which I, we all want to do, uh, but it has to be fair. So let's talk about that presidential election for a moment. Uh, we need to spend a moment on that debate. Some people say it wasn't a debate, it was more like a brawl. Uh, you had some skepticism, I think, about whether the former vice president yeah. should have participated. Would you advise him now to go forward with the next two debates, given what we saw in the first one? Well, you're right about using the word skepticism here. Uh, I, I myself, uh, just between us, I myself did not think that Joe Biden uh, should bring, dignify a debate with the president who has no commitment to fact, evidence, evidence data, uh, demeans the office he holds. Uh, and you saw on that stage authenticity on both sides. President authentically a bully, Joe Biden authentically decent. Uh, so I, it, it was a sad occasion for our country. It broke my heart. I haven't really slept five hours 
combined both nights since then because of what it meant for our country to have a president not commit to honoring the peaceful transition of government or re condemning white supremacists, uh, abolishing the Affordable Care Act, ignoring the uh, co uh, climate crisis and talking about clean air, clean water when he degrades the environment almost every day or at least two or three times a week with his policies and decisions. So. Uh, so it was a, it was a sad occasion. Uh, so I, you know, people say, well, they should have had a button that turned one microphone off while the other person was speaking. Whatever it is, I think one and done, uh, one and done. But I, Randy, when people run for president, that's president of the United States. Yeah. Joe Biden will do. He's courageous. Yeah. I never thought he shouldn't do it because I didn't think he would do well. Yeah. I thought he shouldn't do it because I thought uh, something like but, this could happen. But, but if we're up to you, one and done. <laughs> one and done. Okay. I look forward to the vice presidential debate next week. That's the next one, next Wednesday. Well, thank you so much. It's always a treat to have you with us. Thank you, David. As the Speaker My of the pleasure. House, and she is, of course, Nancy Pelosi. Coming up here, Europe is grappling with a surge in the coronavirus, and now there may be problems with that 750 billion euro stimulus plan. We talk with editor of The Economist. She is Zanny Minton Beddows. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. A fragile European economy is threatened once again by the spread of the coronavirus, with various shutdowns back in vogue. For a read on the European economy and what's being done about it, welcome now Zanny Minton Beddows. She's editor in chief of The Economist and a contributor to Wall Street Week right here at Bloomberg. So it's great to have you back with us, Zanny. Give us your take, sort of on the ground, as it were, over there. What's going on with COVID 19? It seems to be coming back. Well, it's great to be with you again, David, if, if on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, it is coming back, and we are seeing a rise in cases across Europe, particularly in France and Spain. I mean, there was a lull in the summer. I think everybody thought this was behind them. Uh, the kind of guards were taken down a bit. And then suddenly, really starting the end of August, early September, people coming back from vacation, cases suddenly started rising. It's not happening everywhere. It's particularly France and Spain. The UK also rising reasonably fast. Italy looks relatively okay, and so does Germany, although they are going up there. And I think the interesting thing is how countries are reacting, because absolutely nobody wants to go back into full lockdown. But you see countries across Europe trying to grapple with what can they do in terms of tightening restrictions that may just get this under control without them having to go back into a full-on lockdown, which would, of course, be devastating for the economy. And I think that that trade-off is being made in different places in different countries. Countries are looking at each other, copying each other. But it feels kind of grim, actually. It really does feel like we're going back into the long haul of this. It's grim for people who are locked up in their houses again if that happens. It's also grim potentially for the economy. Give us a sense of how the European economy is doing. At one point, we thought you were ahead of us on the rebound. I don't know anymore. Well, that was true. And it's been really interesting to watch. And right now, actually, I would bank on the U.S. recession being shallower and recovery. It depends, of course, what happens, as you were discussing just with the speaker. It depends what happens with the U.S. stimulus. But right now, I think it's pointing more towards the U.S. bouncing back a bit faster. But this is an interesting question. It's obviously, it depends on how countries deal with, the, with COVID itself. It is very, very hard to have an economic recovery when you have the virus raging. But I think we're also seeing the differential effect of the kind of policy response. And, and to kind of simplify a bit, the US had a very big stimulus to start with, obviously now nothing for a while, and, and with luck, that will be sorted out soon. Uh, but it furloughed workers, the unemployment rate shot up, the kind of creative destruction mechanisms are being allowed to work. Europe has taken a very different approach. Again, in broad brushstrokes, much more use of furlough, which in the European context means paying people while they are still with their old jobs. So there are a lot of people who are still being paid by the government, effectively, and are attached to their old jobs. And many of those jobs, I think, are not going to come back. And we are seeing the longer this goes on for, and you've discussed it on your show many times, we're going to see fairly substantial changes in consumption, consumer behavior, which has huge impacts for travel, for retail. And the knock-on effects of those in terms of job losses are still being seen, and there's a lot more to come. And Europe is going to take longer, I think, to readjust 
resources to have the kind of, you know, Schumpeterian creative destruction because of its policy response. And so there's a very real sort of trade-off. Europe cushioning workers much more to, in their existing jobs, the US probably taking a different approach. And, and I think, well, we'll see. Over time, I'm sure the one that allows creative destruction to happen is one that leads to, in the medium term, a more dynamic economy. Uh, Zenny, as you say, we had a massive stimulus, $2.2 trillion here. They're talking about even yet more of that. There's a 750 billion euro stimulus package that was agreed upon, very, I think, historic across all of Europe to be really funded all of Europe. At the same time, it sounds like there may be some glitches in that at this point. Where does that stand? So you're right. There are some questionings, particularly by Germany, but I think you're, 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 the word you've used is appropriate, glitches, because the bigger picture is that for the European Union, for the Euro area, this was a very, very big step forward. I mean, people talked about it being a Hamiltonian moment for Europe. I think that's an exaggeration, but if you remember throughout the Euro crisis, 2010, 2011, 2012, the Germans were very, very resistant to any notion of mutually issued debt, any, any notion going in that direction. They were very, very against. And that Rubicon was crossed this year, thanks to COVID, and thanks to a deal really between the Germans and the French. And though, so while you're right that there is, you know, there is going to be, there are going to be some glitches turning this into reality, and and the the you know the EU is a long way from actually sort of finalising it. I think the kind of symbolic and indeed sort of you know, you know, mental uh, Rubicon has been crossed in that it will happen in some form, and that's a very very big step forward for the euro area. In the United States, it, it certainly has not been only fiscal stimulus. The Federal Reserve has really stepped up, both with uh, approaching zero interest rates as well as bond buying, various lending programs. The ECB also has stepped up. What do you do? How do you assess what they've done so far? Is there more that they can do? They have stepped up. I would say that the Fed has uh, stepped up even more ambitiously. I mean, essentially backstopping pretty much everything. The ECB has done a lot. It could do more, and it has been its communication hasn't been hasn't been quite as clear cut. And I think in Europe there is a sense now. Well, now that the you know European Union governments at last are doing more with fiscal policy, maybe the central bank doesn't have to do so much. And actually, sort of paradoxically, I think you need to you need to be pushing on both fronts right now. So the the ECB is is absolutely not out of the woods. If you look at the inflation expectations in Europe, they are way below its target really for the foreseeable future. So. It's, it's not out of the woods, and the European economies are absolutely not out of the woods. And, and particularly, let's come back to jobs. You mentioned them briefly before. What is the situation in jobs? Because, as you said, people were kept on the payroll, as it were, by government subsidies, although those seem to be coming down in places like the United Kingdom. Uh, question of how long that can keep going. But as a practical matter with jobs, uh, are we in danger of a jobless recovery? Because I see some PMIs from, from well, manufacturing quite strong. Recovery. I think it's yeah, I think it's not even a jobless recovery. We are in danger in Europe of seeing a really quite sharp rise in unemployment as these jobs, which are, you know, if you will, no, no longer real jobs come to an end. Because as you say, you know, governments are not going to be able to keep paying people to be attached to their old jobs forever. And so at some point, uh, those jobs will be lost. People will be laid off. We will, And we are seeing it. We're seeing, you know, firms upon firms beginning to lay more people off. And my worry is that we see a large rise in unemployment before we see the jobless recovery, if you will. So there's a kind of short term, short to medium term problem of rising unemployment. And then I think you have the challenge of, you know, how do you get unemployment back down and how do you get people trained and able to move to the jobs which are going to happen in the areas that are growing? And that's where you need the ability to, to help have public policy to help people from kind of declining sectors to growing sectors. And Europe hasn't traditionally, as you know, been terribly good at that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Is there a leader in a word or two? Is Angela Merkel still the leader? You know, there are. there isn't a single one, but Angela Merkel has done remarkably well. I mean, it, it, Germany has handled this relatively well. She has handled it relatively well. So, yes, she's she's right. definitely stood out. But, you know, the, right. I, I, the, the, the interesting thing is we said this at the beginning of this yeah. conversation. Right. You know, every time you look at this, a different country appears to be doing yeah. sort of relatively better. Exactly. It's, we, we had on our, our cover last yep. week a game of whack-a-mole. Right. Yeah, whack-a-mole. Um, and that's what it feels like. That's it's a whack-a-mole like. for each government. Exactly. Zanny, yeah. great to have you with us. Zanny mitten Beddoes, editor-in-chief of The Economist. Up next, we continue our look at Swing State of Ohio. The Democratic congressman from Cincinnati, Steve Shabbat. This is Bloomberg.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The mayors of two Wisconsin cities are asking President Trump to reconsider plans for rallies this weekend as COVID-19 hammers the Midwestern swing state. The president scheduled to campaign at the Green Bay and La Crosse airports Saturday. Wisconsin has one of the highest per capita rates of daily cases in America. On Wednesday, a Trump campaign spokeswoman said everyone attending the rallies would get a temperature check, access to hand sanitizer, and, quote, be provided a mask they are encouraged to wear, end quote. Cases of COVID-19 are once again on the rise in New York State. Governor Andrew Cuomo said today New York reported more than 1,300 new cases of coronavirus, the most since May. The results show a positivity rate of 1.27%. The number of millionaires living in New Jersey is on the rise. That despite criticism that soaring taxes is causing a migration. Governor Phil Murphy tells Bloomberg Television he's standing behind his long sought millionaires tax, which is expected to bring in about $390 million annually. If you've got kids who are school age, if you're working, if you care about health care, we have the number one health care system in America, quality of life location. If you care about talent for your business, there's no better state in America. You get what you pay for in New Jersey. Governor Murphy closed a revenue gap caused by the COVID-19 pandemic with four and a half billion dollars of general obligation borrowing. But he's still pushing for a stimulus bill, saying New Jersey needs a, quote, big jolt of state aid. In the UK, cases of coronavirus have been steadily increasing. Officials have extended a ban on households getting together. And in London, a top public health official says the city is at a tipping point in efforts to limit the spread. Public Health England's London director, Kevin Benton, urged residents to continue to make a conscious effort when it comes to movement and behavior. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts, in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thanks so much, Mark. As we head to the election, we're taking a look at the key swing states, and this week we're looking at Ohio. It's a key state in every presidential election, and we welcome now back to Bloomberg Congressman Steve Shabbat. He is Republican from Cincinnati. Representative Shabbat serves on the House Foreign Affairs and Judiciary Committees. So, Congressman, thank you so much for being with us. Give us a sense of where you think Ohio is in this election right now. I saw that the Cook Report yesterday put it back in the sort of toss-up category. Yeah, well, the president won the state last time. Uh, it's closer this time. I think he's going to carry the state. Um, and it's a very important state. Uh, they say, as goes Ohio, goes the nation. And that's been true most of the time over the year. We're, we're trying to uh, get beyond the COVID. We're trying to defeat it. We want to get a vaccine as soon as possible. Our governor, uh, Mike DeWine, uh, has been very aggressive. Uh, in doing what was necessary to get the COVID under control and to make sure people are healthy. We're opening the schools and businesses. We're trying to do it in as safe a manner as possible because we want the economy uh, to get back roaring again and get people back to work. So we're, we're optimistic, uh, cautiously optimistic, but we've got a lot, of, a lot of work to do yet. Uh, so one of the things that people who follow politics focus on are the suburbs. Uh, and let's talk about Cincinnati, a, a city you know well, having been born and grown up there. Uh, mm -hmm. Talk about the suburbs and the, the president's appeal versus former Vice President Biden's appeal in the suburbs this time, because it's thought maybe it's moved a bit toward the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Well, the pollsters seem to say that, but we haven't had the election yet. And I think on Election Day, we'll, we'll know the truth. And, and my feeling is people are concerned. They're concerned whether they're in urban areas, whether they're in the suburbs or, or in more rural areas. And I think they're looking at both the, the candidates. They're looking at the debate the other night, uh, to the extent it was a debate. And uh, they're, they're looking at the records. And, uh, you know, I think both candidates need to get everything out there, let the public make that decision. Uh, they usually get it right, and uh, I usually agree with uh, the decision they make. We'll see this time. I'm, I'm focused on my race also. We have a tough race, as we always do. I have the, most of the city of Cincinnati, and for a Republican, that makes it a little tougher. But it's an honor to represent the people in my district, and I'm determined to do it to the best of my ability. Well, talk about uh, the Ohio Congressional 1 district, number one district. Uh, you are in a tight race. At least the 538 polls basically show that you may even be a little bit behind. What has changed since four years ago in your district, Congressional District number one? 
Yeah, well, I mean, we look at every race based upon that particular race. I take every race uh, seriously, and I'm going to look at my record and put my record up against my, my opponents. I have a record of delivering uh, results uh, for the people of my district. For example, I'm the uh, ranking member, the lead uh, Republican on the House Small Business Committee. We've worked in a bipartisan way on that committee to deliver the PPP program. Uh, for example, in my district, the first district of Ohio, we've saved more jobs, uh, over a quarter of a million jobs, than any other uh, district in Ohio. So I'm running on my record. Uh, my opponent, uh, unfortunately, has a failed policy of on the Board of Health, where she was at, ran up a deficit to $2.7 million, and health care workers said uh, that it hurt the city's pandemic response. So uh, I'm running on my record, and uh, and I feel that we're going to be fine on Election Day. But I take nothing for granted. For, for your constituents, sir, I mean, what are the issues you think that are most important to them? We sort of hear it's somewhere between the economy and COVID-19, the response to COVID, and sometimes those two are linked up together. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a couple of things. They certainly want to defeat uh, COVID. And I've, as I say, I've been working with the governor, been working with uh, state and local uh, elected officials to make sure that we've make sure their health care is the best that it can be under under the circumstances, that their jobs are protected as much as possible. So we're, we're doing that. We also have to have a vaccine as soon as possible. Operation uh, Warp Speed is appropriately named because I think we're going to get one in record time, hopefully as soon as possible to keep us safe. So that's obviously an issue. The economy is an issue. Um, I supported lower taxes, my opponents for higher taxes. The lower taxes and getting rid of regulations helped us to have the best economy that we had seen uh, in virtually American history until COVID hit. And, and obviously that has affected that to a considerable degree. And I think the other issue that really matters to people is safety in our communities. You know, we saw uh, unrest in Cincinnati, not as bad as it was in Portland and, and uh, Seattle and, and Minneapolis, but it's been there. And again, my record, uh, I've been a longtime supporter of law enforcement and, and safe streets. That's why uh, both the FOP, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police, uh, and our Democratic Sheriff of Hamilton County, which the city of Cincinnati is in. They both endorsed me rather than my opponent. Um, she basically is for doing away with uh, cash bail, which would put more uh, cash bonds to put more uh, uh, criminals on the street. Um, she agreed with the uh, Democrats up here in Washington that we ought to do away with qualified immunity for police officers, meaning that they can be sued civilly. Who's going to want to be a police officer if they can come after your home and your retirement and your savings and that sort of thing? So there's real differences, and I think ultimately the people will make the decisions on those things. Of course, they, of course they will. Is racial justice an issue at all for people in your district? And, and if so, uh, have you come out against white supremacists? The president of the United States seemed to have some difficulty uh, making an unambiguous statement about that the other night. Uh, I'm certainly against uh, white supremacists. I don't welcome their uh, their votes. I don't welcome anything. I think they're a disgrace to the country. But so is Antifa on the left. Uh, and Joe Biden, for example, the other night uh, wouldn't acknowledge that it even existed. Antifa is a real thing. Uh, those are the folks who come after the peaceful protesters. I welcome peaceful protesting. People have every right under the First Amendment to do that. Um, but these Antifa folks come out generally at night, uh, and they're looting and they're burning. They were literally uh, out in uh, Portland trying to burn down uh, the, the federal courthouse out there. So Antifa is a dangerous uh, force. We need to denounce uh, white supremacists, and we also need to denounce uh, groups on the left, particularly Antifa. Finally, as we speak right now, it's the, the possibility of a fourth round of fiscal stimulus seems to hang in the balance right there in the Capitol where you are. We just talked with Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. I think a lot of people around the country say, why can't they get something done? Because a lot of people are hurting. Is there a give on the Republican side to get something done here before the election? Oh, I hope there's give on both sides. And this is something we ought to do in a bipartisan uh, manner. It's something that I've been working on, particularly on the PPP uh, program, helping those small businesses. About half the people who work in America work for a small business, and they were literally going under had we not acted. We did that in a bipartisan manner. We did it in the CARES Act. Now we need to do it again to help those who didn't get one in the first round or need a second round. So, uh, And there's so many jobs that are dependent on that. So let's hope that you can get both sides uh, together working on this. Uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic we'll do it. Okay, well, good luck to you on that. But certainly, thank you so much, Congressman. That's Congressman Steve Shabbat. He's Republican of Ohio.
Coming up here on the eve of jobs numbers, we take a look at the economy and unemployment with Simona Makuta of State Street Global Advisors. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Jobless claims continued to fall last week, though they remain well above anything we had before the pandemic. And tomorrow, of course, we get a look at how many jobs were created all last month. For her take on the state of the jobs markets and the economy overall, we welcome now Simona Makuda. She is senior economist at State Street Global Advisors. Simona, great to have you back with us. Give us your take both on the jobless numbers today is still high uh, and also what we expect tomorrow. Yes, you're right. Definitely higher than normal, and I think we are going to stay here for some time, but also at the same time making a gradual improvement. And then between the initial and the continuing claims, I think it's the continuing claims that are a better signal for what we may get tomorrow in the payrolls report. And if you compare um, over the past month or so, I would suggest that there is actually some upside potential to the consensus expectation of about, you know, eight, seven, 870,000 um, jobs created. Um, I, I easily can see the number being above a million, maybe even 1.2. So, so, Mona, help me on something. Uh, the pandemic has created so much mischief, including some of the economic numbers. We get the jobless numbers, but then there's another number as well that are particularly, they're actually pandemic-related job losses. I think they're mainly temporary or gig workers. Should we put the two of them together to get a real sense of how bad the problem is? Uh, certainly. I mean, you want to have a holistic view of the of what happens in the entire economy, and you cannot exclude gig economy workers. Um, it's really difficult. I have to say this crisis has altered so much of our interpretation of the data. You know, there's a cloud of uncertainty of pretty much on every release as to what exactly does it mean. Um, so you're trying to comb through a number of different angles to, to get the message. But I think the overall message regarding the labor market still is one of continuing, even though slowing, improvement. Uh, did, are you? Are you? Uh, did you pause at all? Given all the announcements we have almost every day now of some company or the other announcing some substantial layoffs, we had Walt Disney mm -hmm. Company with twenty-eight thousand. We have Goldman Sachs with a big chunk. We also have the airlines. It seems like there's a lot of layoffs coming down the pike. Yes, um, and certainly this is not the sort of news one enjoys hearing. Um, the first question when I when I hear these sort of numbers and announcements is whether these are genuine new job losses or are we talking more about a shift from somebody who was already furloughed from their job and now enters the category of permanently unemployed because the position itself has been terminated. And I think we probably have, you know, a, <laughs> big numbers in both categories so far. So I think in leisure and hospitality, in air travel, a lot of those people probably already have been counted in, certain, in, in the, you know, in terms of the unemployment benefits. But the challenge for them would be, you know, not just simply waiting for the job to, you know, the, to be called back to work, but finding a new job altogether. And then there is probably under the surface another wave of brand new layoff announcements, uh, perhaps in companies that haven't been so far front and center in this crisis, you know, more white collar jobs, more, as you mentioned, financial services and other areas of the economy where you have to assume that every company is now recalibrating, uh, rethinking their labor needs. So as we go towards through the end of the year, I would expect to see a little bit of a broadening, actually, across sectors of such announcements. So we may be on our way to recovery, although it seems to be slowing, if anything. But we've got a long way to go, I think it's fair to say. We still have something like 11 mm -hmm. million people unemployed. What do we need to get there? And particularly, let me ask you about the fiscal stimulus that's pending right now. I spoke just a short time ago with Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and asked her about her whether she was optimistic or skeptical about stimulus. This is part of what she said. I am hopeful. Uh, we do have uh, some areas of disagreement that are broad, and, uh, but we're going to be talking again later today. So uh, we're still alive, and we're still talking, and I'm hopeful that we can reach an agreement. 
So, Simona, they're still talking. How important is that next round of fiscal stimulus in your judgment? I'm glad that they are talking, and I am also hopeful that we will get an agreement on some additional stimulus because I do believe it's important. You asked what do we need for a full recovery, and I think when you look specifically to the labor market, you need two things. On one hand, you need the ability to assist those who are have been displaced and may remain displaced for some time. Ultimately, you know, for the labor market as a whole to come back fully, you need, you know, the medical solution and you need confidence broadly to return so that the weak sectors, leisure, hospitality, travel, et cetera, can come back. Um, so I think it's, it's increasingly important, especially um, as the state unemployment benefits expire, you know, expire. Some people have been on, you know, on unemployment for many months to have some reinjection of funds to assist those most in need. I, I do also want to see, and I think it would be more, more appropriate to have more targeted benefits, um, um, but, but definitely we want more. So, so we hear a lot about targeted be benefits. Actually, we heard from Tre Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin last week in Congress saying targeted. What do we mean when we say targeted? What are the targets? I think what you want to ensure is that you reach those people who truly need it most, right? Um, I think it's fair to say that in the early stages of, of the fiscal stimulus policy, the approach or, or the overarching priority was speed uh, rather than precision in targeting, right? So you had checks for, you know, a big chunk of the population. Um, and while, you know, a lot of those who truly, truly needed the money uh, received the money, probably some who, you know, really did not, you know, hang on that extra, you know, $1,000 also received the money. I think at this point, it, it's far better to make sure that those who don't truly need it perhaps don't receive additional assistance so that those who do truly need it are able to receive it. So if we are you know, debating amounts, I think that's where the calculation of targeting the funds comes into very front and center. Um, you can lower the cost, but still um, generate the same impact on, in terms of consumer demand and the economy. Yeah, and finally, Simona, uh, how much of this is re restoring uh, demand and getting the jobs back, and how much of this is actually a shift, a permanent shift in what those jobs are? I think, unfortunately, there will be a permanent shift. We don't know the magnitude of that yet, but you have to assume that, um, you know, things that we have done differently um, because we were forced to, to do it differently for a period of time becomes the new normal. Um, so I, I have no doubt that some permanent displacement, some permanent change occurs. And it's precisely for those type of positions, that so, those types of jobs that you want to retain the ability to assist those people in their transition to the next job, the next sector where they might be employed. Okay, thank you so very much. That's Simona Makuda. She is State Street Global Advisors Senior Economist. And now, a short programming note. Uh, this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, I'm going to be speaking to Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan here on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for a market check. And for that, we go to Scarlett Foo. So, Scarlett, I see the equities are up a little bit. At the same time, they've been up more. How much of this is tied to the stimulus we've been talking about and whether it happens in Washington? It's definitely the backdrop for what we're seeing in equities. I, we're building on a recovery that began last week from the September sell-off. And as Speaker Pelosi told you, Democrats and Republicans are pretty far apart on another stimulus, but she's hopeful they can reach a deal. And in fact, she and Steven Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, have a phone call scheduled in about eight minutes. So the S&P 500 holding at a two-week high. You've got autos and retail leading the gains. Energy in the red here. Oil prices falling back to $38 as Libya and Russia add more supply at a time when demand may not keep pace. We're seeing a weaker dollar lift gold prices to 1909 and 
and the Nasdaq 100 is now at a one month high, David. Wow, how about that? We just finished a quarter. How do we do in the quarter? I think I know we gave back some, at least in the S&P in September, but overall, we're not bad, right? Not bad overall, but everyone's going to remember how the quarter ended, which was with a big sell-off in September. Of course, towards the end of the month, things started to stabilize, and there are a lot of questions now about what happens now that we're in the first uh, trading day of October. In October, a lot of people get worried about it because of crashes in, oh, 1929, 1987, 1997, and 2008. <laughs> but the bigger story here, David, is really the volatility we see in October. I spoke with Sam Stovall of CFRA Research, and he says the biggest increase ever posted in October was when the S&P rose 17% in 1974. That's the best performance of any month. The deepest decline in October was the 22% drop in 1987, and that is the worst of any month. So break it all down. October has the widest standard deviation of monthly returns of any month, 36% higher than the average. And so because of that, we tend to see a bottoming take place in October. It's kind of known as the capitulation month. Uh, bear markets tend to end, as do corrections, which are declines of anywhere from 10% to 19%, as well as pullbacks, any drop of 5% to 10%. And that eventually, David, sets us up for a seasonally stronger period. The fourth quarter, at least in the last two decades, has usually been a winner. The S&P 500 recovers in October from these big swings, and then it gains about one and three quarters percent on average in November, and the gains moderate a bit in December. Election years, of course, are always kind of funny, and the recent history there is not as bullish. We've seen October declines before the last three presidential elections. In 2008, October, uh, Obama versus McCain, Obama versus Romney in 2012, and of course, Clinton versus Trump in 2016. This time, uh, this time around, we're all trying to figure out what's going to happen with fiscal stimulus against a backdrop of likely a second wave of COVID. Clearly, you have this anything-goes election, and Earnings are expected to fall in the fourth quarter as well by about 24% year over year because of very difficult comparisons, David. So, Scarlett, finally, uh, and perhaps briefly, are the volatility numbers showing us anything about what the markets think about the election? Uh, well, people don't know what's going to happen, and they know they don't know, so that sets us up for an expectation of price swings, not just in uh, early November when the election is actually held, but in the days and months to come. A lot of people talk about how there's going to be a contested election. We won't know what happens. I, I think, back to what Kevin says, it won't be election day. It'll be election month. Um, it may be election months because we won't know until perhaps January, given what had happened back in 2000. So you're seeing people definitely price in uh, higher volatility for the months to come. Yeah, election months, not something necessarily to look forward to. Thank you so much to Scarlett Fu for that report on the markets. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk to an historian about those debates. This is Bloomberg.